Good morning. Hope you guys are doing well. It's a great day. I'm already having a great time at church, fellowshipping and talking to you all and just, you know, having those conversations in the lobby. Um, I don't know if you've ever had this happen, maybe, maybe in the church lobby or maybe somewhere else where you've just gotten unsolicited advice. Somebody just, they just wanted to tell you, just had to let you know. If you did this, this would be easier, or this would be better, or, or whatever. There's, this happens in seasons a lot. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Like, maybe, maybe you start in a relationship, and everybody wants to give you their relationship advice. Or you're, or you're engaged now, they're going to give you their marriage advice. Or, or you're about to have kids, that's a big one. Everybody will give you your advice when you're about to have kids. When you're walking around the store pregnant, random people will come to you and start giving you advice. They just want to, they want to tell you. It's, sorry, let me get this fixed really quick. Is that better? All right. People will just give you random advice all the time about all sorts of stuff. They want, they want to help. Most of them have good motives. Maybe there's a few who don't, but most of them have good motives. But I was just out of fun and curiosity thinking about this this week, and I just Googled unsolicited advice. And most of what it said was just ways to avoid it or shut it down so it doesn't keep happening. That's like the main thing the internet is worried about you knowing. They're like, how do I stop this and eliminate it from my life? How do people stop telling me what to do all the time? I don't know. I get this a lot. People love to give me advice. Um, and some of it's good. Some of it's less than good. You know, all of those different things. There is there's somebody who, uh, you know, has visited, visited the church a few times, and I love this person. We've had some good conversations. Uh, they go to another church that's very culturally different. Um, and so he was like, Pastor, I love your church. He's telling me, he's like, it's so great. The people are so nice. Shout out to all of you. Um, and then he's like, but I got to tell you what I don't like which is always the worst conversation when you're a pastor, when somebody's like, I got to tell you what's wrong with your church. Um, and so he, he's like, first of all, it's way too short. He's like, the church I go to, it's like four and a half hours. And it's like, he's telling me, and he's like, and that's just sometimes, sometimes it's way longer. And I'm like, that's awesome. I was like, I don't think our people will stay. I think they'll all leave. You know, just it's a different culture. We're, and I love that. And I love that we reach people from different cultures and we're talking about it. And he goes, the second thing, and I'm like, all right, first one was not so bad. What's the second one going to be? He's like, the second thing, he's like, you don't pass the offering. He goes, at my church, we do it two times. <laughs> two times. He was really emphatic about it. He was actually like, he was like two times. He kept repeating it. He's like once after worship and then again after the message. And he goes, sometimes three times. <laughs> sometimes three. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we just get advice that we didn't ask for. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. But I want to ask this question, could it sometimes actually be God speaking through somebody else? Could it sometimes be the Holy Spirit speaking through somebody? We're going to talk about that a little bit today. We've been in a series on the book of Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible. We've been looking at the life of Moses, this well-known historical person, this figure from our faith who's had all of these different God moments, and we've been learning how his life applies to ours. We've been seeing him grow and how he's led by God. The Israelites are led by a cloud and by fire. That's why our series is called Led by Fire. They're led very clearly, or there's these moments where they have enemies, some of them real enemies, like last week when they're in battle and they win the war by Moses raising his hands. And we talked about how we have external enemies. And we talked about how they had grumbling and complaining issues. And sometimes it's not even an external enemy. It's just the people around us. And this week, we're going to see another thing that comes up. How Moses actually can be his own enemy in some ways. We're going to see how he gets some unsolicited advice. And we're going to look at how he responds and what we have to learn from that. So we're going to be in Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18, you can flip there, you can scroll there. We've got it on the screen. It says this, now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses. You guys, some of you already see where this is going. You're like, my in-laws give me the most unsolicited advice. The father-in-law of Moses heard of everything God had done for Moses and his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. So at some point during this journey, Moses 
was like, hey guys, this isn't the safest place. I'm going to send you out, wife and kids. We've got a lot of stuff we're about to deal with. Different commentators uh, think this happened at different points, but it's not really that important. The point is that they're not with him, and now that they've experienced some amount of freedom, they're about to come back. So one of their sons was Gershom, um, which Moses was named him for being a foreigner in the land. He kind of like, they would name their kids based off of what was going on. So he's like, I'm a foreigner. This was early on. The second one is Eliezer. My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. That's what his name means, which is a really long description for the name. Um, but what I love is that you can see Moses' faith growing. Like you can see he was like, I was a foreigner. He's like, and that's what I named my first son. And my second son, this is where I'm at now, is I've seen God help me. Well, after this is happening, we see that he's about to get an unexpected arrival, unexpected family reunion. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Uh, your in-laws send you a text and they're like, hey, we're coming over. It, was, it wasn't even an invite. It wasn't <laughs> Some people are already really into this sermon. But it's just they just show up. Some amount of notice, hey, we're coming next week, or hey, we're coming in an hour, or, or hey, we're at your front door. This is verse 5. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' son and wife, came to him in the wilderness, where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jeth Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and went into the tent. I love this. And I mean, we're going to get to the later part of the chapter, which is really where we're going to spend most of our time. But I think it's worth noting that he greets him with honor. That he bows down and he kisses him and he, he like shows affection and love and culturally shows him honor. It's the same way that he actually greets his brother Aaron too, which I think is really cool, is that Moses has not lost sight of who he is. That even though God's using him to lead millions of people, he's still humble. And we actually see Moses' humility throughout these, these books that are written about him in the, the beginning of the Bible. And um, I also noted that his father-in-law is a priest of Midian. He's a priest of Midian. And some people disagree on what this means, but most agree that he's not worshiping Yahweh. That his father-in-law was a priest for another god. And you know, if you remember Moses' story, if you've been tracking with us through Exodus or you've seen the prince of Egypt, you know that Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house, had an identity crisis, ran away, found this tribe out in the desert, married the daughter, and that's how he's got this relationship. And so now his father-in-law, a priest from another tribe, is coming with his family, and Moses is about to catch him up on everything that's happened. He says in verse 8, Moses tells his father-in-law everything the Lord has done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and how all the hardships they had met along the way. Um, he tells them all about it and how the Lord had saved them. I love this. Is that it's just really practical. It's just Moses is just like, hey, this is what's happened. This is what God has done on our behalf. And I don't want to go past that too quickly that our story has so much power. Um, Paul talks about how you are a letter. Paul is an apostle in the New Testament. He'd always write letters to churches and be like, this is what you're doing great. This is what you're doing wrong. Um, I feel like if Paul wrote a letter to a church, you'd be a little intimidated. You'd be like, what is he going to say? And so Paul is like, but you as people are living letters. You represent what God has done. This is what it says. You are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. He's like, your life is a testimony. What God is doing in you and through you isn't just for you. I think, I think sometimes we, we make our faith so personal. We make it just about us and Jesus. And that's important. We need a personal relationship with God. But your relationship with God isn't just for you. Because otherwise, when you gave your life to Christ, he would just be like, all right, great, boom, now let's go. You'd be out of here. But he's still got work for you to do. He's got things. He's got stuff he's planned for you. And you have the opportunity to just simply share your story. This is what God's doing in my life. I know I've had conversations with people in the church about how do I get better at sharing my faith? How do I tell my coworkers? How do I tell my friends? How do I tell my family? One of the easiest ways, the best place to start is just share your story. This is what God has done for me. This is how he saved me. This is how he's rescued me. This is how my life has changed. That's why we love celebrating baptism, too, because it's just a representation that God has changed somebody's life. So Moses does that. 
He pulls him aside. He's like, this is, what, this is what's been happening. And Jethro was delighted to hear all the good things the Lord has done. He was excited about it. He, he said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, who rescued the people from the hands of the Egyptians. He's like, praise God. Your story makes me happy, Moses. As a father-in-law, he can't help but be excited. And what's interesting is some, some people are like, where did this story come from? Because if we lead right later in the Pentateuch, we actually see this conversation took place a little later. But in Moses' recording of this story in Exodus, he moves it up a little in the timeline. You know, it actually happens. They're already at the foot of the mountain, and the laws come, and all of that is already in place. But in Exodus, this happens right after the battle they just had. And I think it's for this reason. I think it's to illustrate how different people are just going to respond differently. That it's up to God, it's up to his timing, it's up to what his spirit is doing. Because the Amalekites, who are in chapter 17, didn't like it. They're like, we don't like what God's doing. We're going to attack you. We don't want to, we don't, we're not down with that. This priest of Midian, his father-in-law, is like, that's awesome. It causes him to lean in. And I don't know if you've experienced this, and this is part of persevering and continuing to share your faith, though. Some people, it continues to push them away. And some people, it continues to draw them in. It doesn't mean we stop. It doesn't mean we, we quit sharing our faith. It just means we don't know what God is doing in that moment. We don't know how they're going to respond. Paul, Paul uses it with the idea of aroma, with smell. He's like, some people, what God is doing, it's like a, a sweet fragrance. It's the smell of life. And other people, he's like, it's, it smells of death. It scares them away. Because God hasn't worked on them yet. So... This is what he says now, and I love the statement, verse 11. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. This is his father-in-law speaking. He's like, hey, I know now that who you serve, that God you told me about who showed up in the burning bush, that's the real God. That's the, he's actually Yahweh. He actually is in charge of all the other gods. And then he brings a, a burnt offering and sacrifices to the Lord. And, and this is to believe, many believe this is his conversion moment. Where he's like, hey, I, I actually see who he is. Because of your story, I'm changing my whole life. I'm going to worship Yahweh now. Don't underestimate the power of your story. And so if this was just where it ended, it would be like, great, that's a nice little story. His father-in-law comes and drops off the kids and his wife and gives his life to Christ because of what God is doing in his life. And then he goes home. But that's not what happens next. What happens next is, Moses goes back to work the next day and brings his father-in-law with him. That's all of your dream, right, is to go to work with your in-laws. That they can come watch what you're doing and just, you know, encourage you along the way. So this is what happens. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what, what is it that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and judge? Will, while all these people stand around from morning to evening, because, like, think about it. He's leading a, a group of a couple million people, and he's the leader, and he feels the responsibility for it. And there's a long line, and Moses works all day, and he's like, why are you doing that? And Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. He's like, I don't know if you've noticed, I'm kind of a big deal. No, he doesn't actually say that. He's actually really humble about it. He's like, whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them what God thinks about it. He's like, I'm just, I'm doing what God's called me to do. I'm leading the people. And Moses, his father-in-law re replies and says, what you are doing is not good. That's brutal, right? That's like his, his father-in-law spends one day at work with him, and he goes, what you're doing is not good. And if I was Moses, I think I would be like, all right, I hear you, but, but also it is pretty good. Because I just led all of these people out of Egypt in slavery. We just won a battle. I'm not doing that bad. Because we have this thing inside of us, too, where we want approval, right? We want people to notice what we're doing. And I think this would be hard to receive. I think most of us would be pretty defensive. If, if we were like, if, if, if he was just like, what you're doing is not very good, we would be like, yeah, but... Or we just be like, no, we just completely ignore it. He says in verse 18, you and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You can't handle it alone. He's like, Moses, this is too much. You can't do this on your own. 
And I think that's worth noting for us is whatever God has called you to, it doesn't mean you're supposed to do it by yourself. That God isn't calling you to, to be solo and just do this thing that he's asked you to do all on your own, on an island, by yourself. That's never how God operates. He always has people do things in community, with others, in support. You know, we just saw in the last chapter that Aaron and her were holding up Moses' arms. There's, there's beauty in community. There's, there's necessity in not doing things by yourself. You can't handle it alone. It's true in life and it's true in ministry. It's just true. You can't, you can't do everything by yourself. And so his father-in-law goes on. He says, listen. He's like, I'm going to give you some advice. And we're like, we kind of thought that was the advice. You just said he's not doing a good job. He goes, you must be the people's re representative before God. He's like, yeah, that's what you're called to. And bring the, their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees. All the stuff you're doing is good. He's like, but you need to select people who are capable. Capable men from all the people who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because you will share it with them. They'll share it with you. You won't be in it alone. I love how practical this is. His father-in-law is like, I'm not just going to tell you you're not doing a good job. I'm going to tell you you're not doing a good job and tell you, hey, this is a solution. Maybe have some people help you. Figure out what their strengths are. Maybe they're a 10-person person, person or maybe they're a 1,000-person person, but invite some other capable people to help carry it with you. Don't, don't do it alone. I don't know what God's calling you to do. I don't know what he's asking you to do, but he's not asking you to do it on your own. This is the beginning of God laying out what he's going to do in the New Testament where he explains that leadership is meant to be a group thing. That, that it's not supposed to just be one or two people, that it's supposed to be a group leading the people. And you're supposed to have elders and deacons and all of those things. And we'll get into that more another time. But this is the beginning seeds of that. He's like, you're not supposed to do it on your own. And Moses wasn't defensive. I think that's the first thing I want us to know, is that if we want God to speak to us, we got to not be defensive. We just need to let ourselves hear it. And I'm not saying everything that everybody says is good advice. It's not. Not everything. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But are we going to put our defenses down enough to hear, to know if it, it could be God? God, is that you? Because here, we love it when God leads us by fire. We love it when the Holy Spirit speaks to us or something pops out from the word of God or all of these different ways God speaks. And he speaks in so many ways, but he also speaks through people. Proverbs talks about how the words from a friend can sometimes hurt, but in the end they help. That if it's the people who are closest to us and know us and actually love us, not necessarily the random stranger, but the father-in-law or the friend or the coworker who can speak into our lives and say, hey, I don't, I don't know if you're seeing this clearly. They can help us see what we can't on our own. I don't know if you've gotten advice that maybe you could reflect on and think, hey, maybe, maybe God was in that. You know, when I was reading about unsolicited advice, there was somebody who said, unsolicited advice is like the junk mail of life. That it's just you get so much of it, and, and I think we treat it like that because it feels like that. And we're just, we throw it away, throw it away, throw it away. Another person said another thing, forget that. But I think we need to go through it a little bit more carefully. That some of it is worth throwing away. But maybe God is speaking through something. Maybe he's put that person in your life just to bring your attention to something you'd otherwise miss. And if our defenses are up, we might miss the voice of the Holy Spirit through that person. We might miss what God is saying to us. I love how practical his advice is. He says, you'll wear yourself out. But he also says, you'll wear them out. That exhaustion doesn't just affect us, it affects the people around us. This is obviously especially true in leadership. We, we want our leaders to work hard, but we also don't want them to ever stop working. But we know if they're not healthy, then we won't be healthy. And it's like this weird tension where we're like, we need you to work hard, and if you're resting, that's not good because you got stuff to do. Moses, you have to lead us. We need you. But we also know that if Moses keeps that up, he's going to burn out. He's not going to do well. 
We need, we need to encourage people to rest, but also for yourself. What, what rhythms and paces do you have that are unhealthy? See, Moses responds the first time, and he's not defensive. He's just giving a, a, an answer. His, dad, his father-in-law is like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm just doing what God asked me to do. I'm, I'm judging, and I'm, I'm helping people figure out what's right and wrong, and the law, and all those different parts. And his father-in-law is like, that's good. Keep doing that. He's like, you just need to have other people help you do it. And so the question is, it's what has God asked you to do, and what are you doing that's outside of that? And it's, it's okay, some things that are outside of that are not bad, that's not necessarily wrong, but if you're feeling exhausted and worn out and on the verge of burnout, or not even the verge, you're already feeling burnt out, and you're in that place, you're most likely doing something God didn't ask you to do. It might be deliberately wrong, or it might just be like accidentally you might have just got there. It might not even be like sinful wrong. It might just be like, I just committed to too many things. They were good things, but they weren't all God things. And so I'm burnt out. I'm tired. But Jesus' invitation is, is everybody who's tired, he says, come to me. He's like, if you're weary, if you're heavy burdened, come to me. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you're new to church or you don't know church language, they're not talking about like an egg yoke. It's not Y-O-L-K. It's Y-O-K-E. It's an, it's an instrument they would put on the oxen to pull and till up the ground or to pull something forward. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on one side and you're going to be on the other. And we're going to pull this thing together. He said, but I'm going to do most of the weight. In fact, a yoke, the, the weaker animal out of the two only pulls what they can. And the stronger one pulls the rest. That's how it works. It's like, it's really cool. And so the beautiful picture that Jesus is inviting into is he's saying, just do what I've asked you, do what you can, and I've got the rest. You're going to be all right. If you're worn out, come to me. So Moses is not defensive, and he's also filled with humility. He's willing to, to hear what he says. In verse 19, in verse 19, it says, listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. There's another part, he says, may God be with you. And then he says, if God says, it's like his father-in-law even knows. He's like, hey, I want you to pray about this. If this seems like good advice to you and, and it seems like it's actually from the Lord, then do it. So Moses must have prayed about it. And I think that's a great invitation for us is if there's something that might be from God, would you, are you willing to pray about it? Are you willing to be like, God, is that you? Do you have the humility to listen? He says, you must be the people's representative before God. Pray about it. Get before the Lord and share the load. D.L. Moody says, it's better to set 100 men to work than to do the work of 100 men. We need to do things together in community. That's, why, that's the beauty of the dream team is that we're called to this. In fact, in Ephesians 4, it says that, that our job as pastors and leaders is actually to equip people to do the ministry. That, that it's the ministry we're all called to do. Don't miss the opportunity for God to speak to you. He might send a friend who can give you a, a gentle reminder. He might, he might speak through your boss. He might speak through your father-in-law or your mother-in-law. He might speak through your wife. The room got really quiet. It was already quiet, but then everybody's like, you're my wife. And he might speak through your husband. He often speaks through our spouses. He speaks through the people near to us. When they, when they say simple things like it might not be the best idea or, hey, I think you're maybe too distracted on your phone or you're spending too much time doing this or maybe, maybe we should join that small group or maybe we should do this, maybe that's God using them to speak to you. We get in a dangerous place when we think we can't receive anything from the people around us. Maybe we took some bad advice or we're just like, I'm pretty sure that person doesn't know or they've never been in my situation. That's one I hear a lot when we're talking about something. And they're like, they're like they, this friend told me that, but I, they don't know. They've never been in my situation. And there's some truth to that, right? Like we've experienced that as parents. They're like, well, they haven't had kids. They don't actually know what it's like. And you have kids and you're like, oh, I get it now. But there's also, there's also truth that they still might know. Paul didn't have kids. He writes about parenting. There's other places in Scripture where we learn things from people who hadn't gone through it. And in this instance, he, 
his father-in-law had never led a couple million people. He had his own little tribe, his own little family, but he still had enough life experience to see, hey, Moses, this isn't good leadership principles. You're missing something. So don't discount it because of the source. Don't discount it because of your own ego. Be willing to be like Moses and say, God, are you speaking? Is this you? Do you have something that you're trying to say to me? In verse 22, it says they should always be available to solve the common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. And it says, let the leaders decide the smaller matters. And I love this last part. It says, making the task easier for you. Making the task easier for you. I think we know, hey, yeah, I should maybe get advice from other people, or maybe that's God speaking, and maybe I do need humility to receive it, all of these different things. But did you know that it's actually for your own benefit? That Psalm 23 talks about how he wants to lead you into to calm green pastures, to lead you beside still waters. I think sometimes we have this idea that everything God is asking us to do is going to be hard and difficult and make our life worse. I've had this conversation with a couple of you. You're like, I'm a little afraid of opening myself up to hear from God because I'm worried he's going to call me to be a missionary and my life's going to be horrible. That's the actual summary of a conversation. That's real life. And I hear that. And God does call us to pick up our cross and follow him. And there will be hard parts. But he also says, I'm going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm going to lead you into green pastures and still waters. I'm going to restore your soul. And in this advice, Moses' life actually gets easier. Did you know that sometimes God is speaking through other people in order to help you? You could be missing a very word from God that is going to help your life get easier or better or back on track, but our ego is getting in the way. We're unwilling to hear it from that person. God, if you spoke to me through the cloud or the fire, or if you spoke to me through something else, or if I saw it in your word, then I, I'll do it. But, but they don't know what they're talking about. My father-in-law has never led this many people. He doesn't know. I've been doing a great job, God. I led them out of Egypt. I crossed the Red Sea. We won our first battle. We're doing great. It's easy for us to be defensive. It's easy for us to have pride. But are we going to miss the voice of God? Verse 24, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He must have had that confirmation in his own spirit that this is actually from God. Because even his father-in-law is saying, is this from God? If it's from God, do it. He did it. He chose capable men, and then he sends him on his way. I love this. I love how simple this chapter is. This was a weird, in all honesty, just transparency, backing up from the sermon. Like, this is one of those weird things where it's like behind the curtain. Preparing for this message felt really different than preparing for some of the other ones. You know, like, there's all of these obvious theological truths in the first 17 chapters and all of these things that, that like everybody's talking about. And even in the commentaries I'm reading, everybody's like, this is a strange chapter. They're like, it's a lot of detail for Moses. Moses is usually pretty high picture, but he goes into great detail talking about how his father-in-law comes and gives him this advice that he takes. And I'm like, I think sometimes we over-spiritualize things. And I think we need that healthy balance. We need to know that we live in a spiritual world. And like we talked about last week, some of our battles are won in prayer and in praise and in God's presence. But we also need to know sometimes things are really practical, that God has put people in your life that can speak truth, that can see things that you can't see yet that are going to help you. I don't think we should discount one for the other. I don't think we're, we're people who only seek God's presence or only seek the practical. We seek them together. God, we desperately need you. We need you to speak to us. And we're going to do what makes sense, and we're going to listen to the people around us. We're going to get wise counsel. We're going to read the book of Proverbs, and Proverbs talks about where there's many counselors, people prevail. That we need voices in our life, that we're not going to discount what somebody's saying. We're going to pray, but we're also going to listen. We're going to be practical. And so I thought a good way to end would just be to pray and ask God, God, is there some advice that I missed? 
Is there something that somebody said or something that, that even was from your still small voice or from scripture or from anywhere, God? Is there something that you were speaking to me that I missed? Because here, I'm going to let you in on, on a little thing that I tell people all the time. When people are like, I don't feel like I'm hearing from God. I often say, well, what's the last thing you heard him say? What's the last thing you heard him say? Did you act on that? I think he sometimes is just like, I just want you to do that thing. That first thing I talked to you about. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to pause and pray. We're going to create a little space for God to speak to us and remind us. Some of you already know. Some of you are like, had a thing come to mind. Don't just write that off of like that thing popped into my mind because you're talking about advice. That might have been the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying for sure. I'm saying pray about it. Ask God. So God, we turn to you. Ask, would you speak to us? God, we don't want to live in our own strength. We don't want to wear ourselves out. Moses could have been headed towards burnout. God, we don't want that. We don't want that for ourselves or for us as a, as a group, as a family. God, so we ask that you would speak to us. Would you remind us of something you've already said through someone, through your word, in a past moment? Would you bring it back to our mind? God, something that, that we're doing that's making life more difficult or something that we should be doing that we forgot about, something simple, a reminder of something we used to do and stopped doing. God, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you speak in so many different ways, that you speak through your word, that you speak in signs and wonders, that you speak to us in times of prayer, that you speak to us so many ways. God, we would not forget that you speak through the people around us. Would we have the humility to hear it? Would we have the obedience to put it in action? God, I pray that some simple practical advice would be put in to practice and that it would make somebody's life easier. At times that almost seems like, is that even biblical? To make our life easier? And God, I just pray that you'd give somebody peace in their mind to say, yes, this is me. This is me reminding you. I'm not calling your life to be easy, but I am trying to make it easier. I am calling you into rest, into peace, to walk alongside of me to lay down in green pastures beside still waters, that your soul may be restored. God, would you forgive us for the times that we move faster than you do and do more than you're asking us to? And would you forgive us for the times that we slow down to the point of not doing what you've asked us to do? Would you help us just to be in step, day by day, moment by moment, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to encourage you too that rest is good. Moses was headed towards burnout. And I think like a lot of things, we can go extreme on this one way or another where we work so hard it becomes idolatry that we put more trust in ourselves to accomplish it than we do God. For some of us who are prone to go that direction, it actually takes faith to rest. But I also pray that on the other side of that, none of us would be so lazy as to not do what God is asking us to do. See, work without rest is pride, but rest without work is laziness. We need both. We need to do what God's asking us to do in the time that he asks us to do it, and then we need to slow down and enjoy what he's asking us to be a part of, our families and our friends and our community. That wasn't in my notes. I just wanted to remind you guys. Rest is important. I think that's what Moses' father-in-law saw for him. You're moving too fast, Moses. You're doing more than you need to do. What you're doing is really good. It's really important. It's, it's from God, and it's for God's people. But you're going to not be able to do it for a long time if you keep it up. I have had people in our life speaking to us, that, and they say, if you want to go fast, Go alone. If you want to go far, go together. If you want to do what God's called you to do for a long time and not just a short time, you need the right pace and the right people. You need to go at the, the pace of grace and what God's asked you to do in that moment 
And you need people around you to help you to be by your side, to lift your arms as we talked about last week. People that Moses could delegate to and say, hey, you can handle a lot and you can handle this much, but together we can handle all this that God's entrusted to us. What are those things in your life? For all of us, there's relationships that go both ways, right? Sometimes we're the ones supporting somebody else and sometimes we need people supporting us. I also want to pause, and we do this every week, is if you've never given your life to Christ and you're hearing this idea of rest and peace in your soul, you can't fully understand that until you decide to follow him. And I would love nothing more for you to make that decision today, to say, "I'm, I'm all in. What does it even mean to be a follower of Jesus? What it means is you acknowledge your need for him that you can't do this on your own, that when he says, come to me all who are tired and heavy laden, I will give you rest, it's an invitation. It's also necessary because we read in scripture that all have missed the mark, all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard, his standard of holiness and perfection. That's every single one of us. But Jesus came and lived a perfect life that we couldn't live and said, I'm gonna take the punishment for you falling short. I'm going to pick up the debt for it. All you have to do is is make a trade with me. Trust in me and I'll give you my life and I'll take all of your sin and shame and punishment. That's a no-brainer trade. That's the best deal that's offered. And it comes with sacrifice and it comes with the cost of following him. But you find that that's what you were looking for the whole time. Joy and peace that he offers. So if you've never made that decision to follow him, it's as simple as saying, God, I need you. I admit that I do. I acknowledge my own brokenness and the ways I've sinned against you. And I believe that Jesus died for me and rose again so that I could be forgiven. I put my trust in him. I put my faith in him. Would you make me brand new? Would you change me from the inside out? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? And would I follow you from this day forward? Would it not be a one-time decision, but a change of direction for my life? In Jesus' name, amen.